This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Unregistered is still a completely listener-supported podcast. So if you want to keep the show going, I need your help. To make a contribution, you can go to unregisteredlisteners.com. You'll receive access to the private unregistered Facebook page where I discuss the ideas from the show with listeners. You'll also receive gifts of unregistered merchandise, transcripts of the interviews, autographed copies of my books, webinars on history, politics, culture, and philosophy, and a download of my 11-part video lecture course on A Renegade History of the United States. I really hope you can help me keep these remarkable conversations going. There's another way you can participate directly in conversations with me, like the ones on the podcast. There are still a few tickets left for a special weekend event with me in Salem, Massachusetts on August 5th and 6th. You can get all the information for the event at thaddeusrussell.com slash courses slash weekend. My guest this week was on his way to becoming a professor. He studied creative writing and organismic and evolutionary biology for several years at the University of Massachusetts, but he decided to ditch a career in academia to do much more interesting things. In recent years, he's become a prominent public intellectual and has written some of my very favorite essays on sexuality, philosophy, and on his own highly unorthodox life. If you're a gay man, you probably know of him, but for very different reasons. Connor Habib is a star performer in gay pornographic films. He's also one of very few bona fide sex radicals living in the United States. Connor recently started his own web series called Against Everyone with Connor Habib, which you can support through his Patreon site. So I'm in the house of Connor Habib. And it's in Hollywood. It's a lovely house. And um, I'm just going to put this on the table right now so that we can get it over with and move on. <laughs> Connor's a gay porn star uh, and has been a gay porn star for how long again? Uh, eight years, going on nine. And full-time for much of that? Like For a lot of it was full-time. Now it is not really full-time. It's just sort of an occasional thing I do. But gay porn, is, you know, it's like, being a little bit in gay porn is sort of like being a little pregnant. <laughs> like you either are a gay porn performer <laughs> no, or no. you're not. <laughs> well, but wait, but being pregnant is not eternal. Don't you mean it's eternal? Like once you're a po- gay porn star, you're always one? Yeah. Well, that is, there- is true now. There is no, there's that, remember this idiotic documentary after porn ends. There is no after porn ends now. You can never escape. You do it and yeah. that's that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's certainly true that you'll, probably always be identified as such by others right Mm -hmm. yeah but um so we're here in his house and uh it's lovely and uh i have been stalking connor a little bit from afar because i noticed that you know there are a lot of gay porn stars out there but there aren't (laughs) any that i'm aware of maybe you know some who think like this guy here um and i was really attracted to the way he thinks about certain things in particular sexuality but really politics and culture generally and um i so i was kind of stalking him following him on twitter reading his stuff and i guess you could say flirting i don't want to go down that road too far but you know i was i was trying to like say things nice to him on twitter etc and he never responded he never gave me any love back as far as i could tell although i think you followed me that was exciting 
Uh, but otherwise, I got no response from you, so I didn't know what was going on. Finally, I got this <laughs> podcast going. Then I'm somebody. Then he'll talk to me. So he's here. Finally got him. <laughs> no, we met last week, and we tried to record a podcast, and it failed miserably because I'm a, a moron when it comes to technical stuff, and it, it was a disaster. However, I thought, and I think you thought, that it was actually a good thing because we yeah. so much came up. It felt to me like you were like a like a, a racehorse let out of its barn. Like you were just so <laughs> ready to go, ready to run yeah. in places you're not allowed to run often or just where you don't feel like someone's going to hear you. And it seemed that way to me. And so it just it just came bursting out of you and it was really, really thrilling to me. And I felt like we had so much common ground and where we disagreed, it was just really interesting as, as well. It wasn't just a fight. Um, yeah. So we saw it as a rehearsal and we're back and this one's going to stick because I have a real sound guy this time <laughs> and I'm so excited about this. So yeah, let's get this over with. He's a gay porn star. That was his major only occupation for quite a while, right? That was your only form of basically, income? Basically, yeah. I mean, I was, I was writing, but the, you know, I'm publishing, but the writing wasn't my main livelihood. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, so, but yeah, let's, uh, let's stop talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> for now at least and move on to I, well i guess i would actually say that you being a gay, gay porn star believe it or not maybe the least interesting thing about you <laughs> well that is i think a nice thing to say i you know i mean the thing about the thing about being a sex worker um or porn performer is it teaches you a lot about everything else and so i was already interested in all kinds of shit already you know um it's going to be funny because you and I are going to sort of re, re, rehearse. We're going to re, we're going to go over again some of the things we talked about last time, but nobody knows what we talked about last time because that was sucked into the void. But um, you know, one of the things is I was sort of on track to be a college English professor. I was an English instructor and um, at University of Massachusetts and Western New England College, which is now Western New England University, and so I. Um, I was really involved in humanities. I was also studying the sciences in grad school. So I'm the sort of person who is really interested in everything. So what gay porn essentially did for me um, and being a sex worker did for me is it sort of clarified a lot of the views that I was interested in, a lot of the perspectives I was interested in, um, in, in a lot of different ways. So however it fits in there, it's definitely informed everything else that mm -hmm. that – I care about. Oh, no, certainly. It's just, you know, I'm always, so I had a guest on earlier, Camille Foster, who's, you know, according to Americans, a black guy, no doubt about it, but he doesn't want to identify as black. And that's kind of one of his big things is like, it's a social construct and social constructs are what, you know, have limited people historically in all sorts of ways. So let's, let's do that. Let's not. So he hates being, well, I, I hate, and I said this on that episode, you know, I hate watching, which happens all the time, white people expecting basically forcing black people to talk about being black mm. um and so you know i know that you because we've talked about this you know you're you're a little you're not you don't have that kind of feeling about being identified as a porn star but you kind of you're kind of trying to move beyond it and you're sort of more interested in other stuff and you do get asked about that all the time it's more than i just get asked the same 10 questions all the time about it and it's because there's such a I mean in some ways sort of deservedly so because there's such a line between the, everybody is engaged with pornography in one way or another in our culture right and so there's such a line between what people know about porn and what's true about porn and there's a lot of reasons for that line but people end up asking me very similar questions all the time and to me they're not the interesting questions like so you know they'll be like is there anything you wouldn't do on camera? Like they ask me questions like that. Like, do you, do you get to pick your scene partners? How do you, you know, those sorts of things. And it's not, you know, those are, those are questions that people want the answers to. So I'm happy to answer them. I just get tired of, of doing those again and again and again. And I, I think that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot I'd like to talk about that isn't about the sort of false starting place that a lot of people are asking at when they're asking me. Which is what? What's the false starting place? Well, like, you know, a lot of questions about porn start with like, well, so, I mean, it's altering young boys' behavior. So how do we blah, blah, blah. Like, how do you talk about pornography with your kids? Or like, is aren't 
you know, like, how do we have how this is a good one. This is a sneaky one. Like, how do we have ethical porn? You know, it's like, <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait a second. You know, right. so it's always it always starts from that realm, you know, um, and it could be anti porn or it could be just ignorance or it could be just boring, you know, or in me. the case of the ethical question, uh, unwittingly anti porn. Right. That's what I mean. They yeah. don't know they're anti porn. Right. But they are. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So. um <laughs> so anyway, now I'm, of course, I'm, I'm like stretching my mind thinking, okay, God, what are the 10 questions? Don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't be that asshole, Dad. Ask the interesting question. Uh, you can ask me the 10 so questions. So just throw fine. something at me if I do. Just hit me. <laughs> um, but uh, no, no. Anyway, I, I want to just sort of table that. I want to put that out there to let everyone, everyone know what we're dealing with here. Uh, but table it for the moment. What kind of monster we're dealing exactly. with? Exactly. Well, that is so. That is actually the question, in a sense, which is so you. So we're in Hollywood, California, and you're a gay porn star, uh, but you sure didn't start there, right? And that's hell of a journey. So you know, and this is that's what this podcast is about, in a sense, is how people get um, from birth to where they are now, uh, professionally, politically ideologically and intellectually, culturally, mm. et cetera. So that's why I want to stop talking about you being a porn star now and start talking about how you think you got there. Like, where did that start? Mm. Do you think? And of course, it's not always possible to locate origins of things. But yeah. I know when we talked last week, you did have some ideas about that, which were fascinating. Yeah. I was just grabbed by five guys and thrown in a van, and then now that's I'm what scared. I heard. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. That's <laughs> typical. I mean, for most, not all. Just but. you know, the typical human trafficking experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so where would you like to start? <laughs> well, no, I mean, so you. Well, here's where here's where I want to start. So you were fr you're from a, a small town in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, which one? It's called Catasauqua, which. I believe means land of the drought, although there were not droughts there. Um, land of little rain, something like that. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it's um, so you felt you, you told me that you felt an outsider in many ways. Yes. In that town. And that I think you were talking about how that it was probably in some sense the origin of where you are now. Because you're an outsider, I mean, you being a gay, gay porn star is actually kind of the least of how you're an outsider because you sure. think so differently <laughs> than pretty much anyone. Yeah. Uh, well, the, <laughs> thank, you thank you. Well, the, the, so the, yes. So um, I grew up in small town Pennsylvania, sort of post industrial wasteland, although I grew up in the nice part of the post industrial wasteland and um you know very small town my graduating class was 90 people um my father is a syrian immigrant and um you know which i didn't really understand at first when i was a kid you know and um, my mom is from buffalo new york and um so it was there's difference just by being born right so uh just mm. the sort of being brown, you mean? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but being from an interracial family, mm -hmm. you know, my dad is very dark skinned. And, um, but I'm not, I mean, people, they'll think I'm Italian or, you know, whatever. whatever they, What's that Mexican guy doing? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Whatever they think I, whatever they believe I am. And so, um, and so there was difference right off the bat. There was difference because, you know, my father wasn't really playing sports with me. You know, he didn't, he was from, he's not from Damascus, from a village in the mountains. Hmm. And so it was just sort of like, he had this whole sort of folk way of his life, you know, and I didn't, and so I, I didn't play sports. And of course those were really important in the little How white he, suburban town. I didn't find this out. How did he end up in small town, Pennsylvania? It, you know what? I wish I actually knew the answer because I know he was sort of ahead of the game. There is a big Syrian population near where I grew up now, but I think he was pretty uh, early in on that. Hmm. In fact, there's a Syrian American society in the town I grew up in. So there's that big of a presence. Yeah. And that's where later when I 
got older, I would set up punk rock shows um, because I punk rock shows. I didn't, I didn't know about this. Yes. Uh, I set the up plot just <laughs> continues to thicken. I know. So I set up punk rock shows there at the Syrian American society because, you know, I was bored. And so I would just call booking agents and bands that I liked and be like, do you, will you play in Catasauqua, Pennsylvania? And we'll pay you this percentage of the door. And then I started a record label, but that's all much oh my later. God. I, I didn't know. know any of that. I know that's a, <laughs> that, that was when I was like 18, but, um, it, it, there is a sort of a direct connection in the sense of, I mean, punk rock at a certain point became the sustaining, th- like it was like the thing that kept me alive in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, all kinds of art, but the spirit of punk rock especially and it's uh, sort of defiant, uh, almost utopian idea of hmm. what we could be and who we could be. Hmm. I think we might have some differences there. <laughs> well, you just so you all know, the last time we talked I brought up a utopian thinker and oh, right. and and he he balked at that too. Yeah. So we might get into utopias today. Yeah, let's do that too. I'm all, right. all about utopias. Wow, okay, got to track back now cuz we're <laughs> already losing control of the narrative. <laughs> um so yeah, so your dad, what did he do? He's a contractor, and uh, so he built houses, did developments, all that kind of stuff, and I believe he's still doing that. Okay. So, uh, broadly speaking, middle class? Yeah, and then when my parents got divorced, my mom really did not accept a lot of money, so we were poor, but I didn't know it. Um, my mom was okay. teaching, and she was, and we lived with her most of the time. We also went to his house. You know, I mean, she stayed in the same town. So we went to his house like every other weekend and like one day a week. But um, she was teaching and she was also selling encyclopedias door to door. And she was just busy all the time. So it's me and my sister living with my mom. And she would do this thing where she would take us to (laughs) McDonald's and she would she would get us food and like she would take a bite of my sister's food knowing that my sister was going to say now why did you take a bite out of mine you didn't take a bite out of his you know and then she would take a bite out of mine to like and then she would keep evening it out and i didn't realize she was eating like that was her Hmm. eating because she didn't have enough money to pay for Mm. food for herself um and i didn't realize that gravy bread which was bread with gravy on it was a poor person food you know mm. so she she really sort of managed that and then we'd go to my dad's and my dad had all this money um he didn't have a ton of money but wow. it was he wasn't rich but he had a lot it's you know? it's fine i just have to say this it's so similar to my childhood oh really my, yeah my my parent when when did they divorce when i was seven yeah i was five yeah and my father had a stable job as a computer programmer and never wealthy, but solidly middle class, always had a, had a decent, nice house in the sort of hills in Berkeley. And my mother and stepfather were professional revolutionaries, mm-hmm. which meant they were broke um, <laughs> and really poor. So like, you know, the guy from the credit card company came to our house with a big scissors and cut the credit card right in front of my mother. And, wow. and you know, I remember being, she getting, her getting busted at the grocery store for a, uh, bouncing a check. Uh-huh. And, uh, or trying to pass off a check or something like that. Uh-huh. And, you know, it was that, I mean, they made a combined $11,000 a year. I know that in 1978, because I saw their tax return that year when I was a kid. Um, but I was going back and forth between these worlds, right? And so it was like the kind of wealthy or middle class white kids in the hills. And then it was kind of, we. my mother and stepfather lived in basically what is the ghetto of Berkeley. It's not like a hard, <laughs> hard hood, but it is definitely like a mostly black neighborhood, working class and poor. And um, I think you and I talked about this actually, like uh, there was some shame for me around that, like, cause mm. I didn't want the wealthy kids, my wealthy white friends to know about my other life. And I didn't really want the kids in on Otis street to know about the kids in the Hills either. So I was, and I was always embarrassed about either one, right? Cause in Berkeley there's like this reverse snobbery, right? If you're rich, you're bad. And it's actually good to be poor. It's mm-hmm. the, the virtue of poverty. And like one of the reasons I hate that idea so deeply, because I was always going back and forth. I was always a liminal figure, a, a term Connor definitely knows, but many people don't know, which means, <laughs> you know, someone who's sort of in the margins or on the margins, who's not of, of one category or, or another, but sort of goes between two or multiple categories. Anyway. Um, or as you would say, if we're talking about gender, it's its own category. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yes. Right. Which I just, <laughs> ma- that's what I just did. I actually made it its own category. Didn't I, by placing myself in this thing anyway. So you were, you, <laughs> s- sounds similar. So your dad was sort of middle class yeah. and your mother was struggling and on the, on the edge. And we didn't know. And, um, 
And then actually, you know, a really important moment in my whole sort of journey was right around that time. Um, two things happened. And I, uh, one I think you'll find fascinating, the other will freak you out. Oh, good. Um, the, the first one, the fascinating one, <laughs> or the one I think you'll find fascinating, is I saw porn when I was seven. Right. So right after they got divorced, my dad got this big screen TV, very impressive, you know, huge, big, big by today's standards, um, unless I'm just remembering that wrong because I was so small. Mm-hmm. But um, and we had a cable cheater box and which is like you would steal the neighbor's cable. Right. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so we had a remote control that just went up and down right? plus minus. And it was me, the woman who became my stepmother, and my sister sitting on the couch and he was pressing plus, 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 plus. And. Uh, on channel 27, which was the porn channel, um, at that moment, uh, the battery in the remote, remote control died. So when you flip past the channels very quickly, it was just you couldn't even see an image because it was so quick. But when he hit channel 27, the battery in the control died. And uh, just on this giant screen was this giant dick and this giant <laughs> pussy. And it was just slammed. And it was slammed, stuck slammed. there. Yes. It was stuck on that channel. Totally. Porn channel. And, and, my, ever, and ever since, you've been stuck on the porn channel. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> my sister screamed and covered my eyes. My stepmom screamed, and my and my dad ran up and changed, turned the TV off. And I remember, it, you know, like this really symbolizes a lot of. I mean, it really just encapsulates the Western mind when it comes to sex, which is, yeah. look, here's this thing that's completely available to everybody, and it's obviously there for a reason to be seen, but don't look at it. Right. Right. And the tension, sexual tension, and and and, and eroticization comes from the tension between those two things yeah. and i and and from then on i've been into that but also i think you know a big part of my mission has been to sort of remove that like to change to change that to okay. sort of get us out of that so that's yeah. that's one thing so my sister's covering my face and and trying to prevent me from seeing something that i didn't know i was supposed to see so that's my big question is what is it that we are not supposed to see Mm. Um, and the other thing that happened around then, mm. and maybe this was like, a this year- is straight porn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gay porn came mm. later. Um, <laughs> what, would, what would have happened if it had been stuck on the gay porn? <laughs> <thing>? <laughs> the house would have burned down. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd be a school shooter. Um, <laughs> right. so I, 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 um, the other thing that happened is I was, I think maybe this is a year later and I was really obsessed with cataloging when I was a kid. Um, hmm. I would just make lists of things. Um, I made lists of uh, animals. I made lists of superheroes. I'd write their names or I would just draw them, just sort of like as if I were making encyclopedias. And my brother had this Dungeons and Dragons obsession, right? And so I read his Dungeons and Dragons books when I was a kid, these monster manuals that had all the names of the different monsters. And in one of those monster manuals were the names of all the sort of devils and demons. And I remember... um, Cat, like sort of cataloging those in my mind. I memorize all of them. I know like every animal because I had these things called safari cards. I would memorize every kind. Con- like that that was something I was really invested in was memorizing things. Mm-hmm. And so I was in the backyard sort of just playing, hanging out. And I said the name of one of the devils and I heard this roar behind me. This, it was not an animal. It was not a I don't know what it, I mean, well, I know what it was now. I have my ideas on what it was now. But at the time, it was this sound, this unearthly, horrifying sound. And it was a growl and a scream and a shout at the same time. And I ran inside crying. And that also is a moment that stays with me. So really, I am the worst. I'm the... <laughs> Every mother's fear from the 1980s, I'm all that's realized, which is <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons leads to the devil and uh, porn leads to becoming a prostitute, right? So I'm... <laughs> encapsulate all well that. Well done. Yes. <laughs> so those are two really big moments around that time in my life um, that have... that stuck with me. You know, there are other moments too. I started writing when I was a kid, right around, again, same time. It was a really big time in my development. started writing a novel when I was... Uh, like eight years old Gosh. and my mom got an Apple two C computer and I started writing this fantasy novel. Um, cause I would read these really big books. These like 500 page novels when I was in, uh, elementary and middle school. And I started writing this fantasy novel. So that was a big thing too. Um, so all these things happening at this time where 
you know, I mean, your teeth are, your teeth are, have just finished falling out or your permanent teeth are just developing and I'm just having all this shit happen. Mm -hmm. Now the, uh, I would say the mainstream psychologist's first take would be, hmm, Connor, this all seemed to coincide uh, with the divorce. Yes, (laughs) totally. (laughs) Of course. Which seemed very, um, it went very smoothly and I actually didn't even really know what's happening. I had my birthday party and someone bought me a book called Ben, I think it was called Benjamin Bunny moves to a new house. And I was like, Oh, and the woman, she was a babysitter. She's like, that's because you're moving. I was like, we're moving. Mm. I didn't know. So it was another thing that my mom had sort of kept repressed. So yeah, I think, I think sure it has a lot to do with that. But I also think that that time in people's life is always big. I think seven, eight is always a big time for people. And part of it is the physical transition, the hardening of your bones, the, sort of the kind of growth that starts around then, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Hey, it's funny you said hardening, and I thought you were going to say something else, and I don't yeah. mean your penis. <laughs> I don't. No, actually, honestly, I thought I was. I thought you were going to talk about hardening of spirit, mm. um, hardening of one's psyche in both good and bad ways, right? Because, you know, when I think back on my parents getting divorced, I was five. I have very vague memories of it, and I certainly don't recall any trauma, right? I wasn't conscious of this thing being, mm. being calamity, you know? Um, and I still, I don't know exactly what it did to me. Um, but I do, (laughs) I have noticed, it seems this is a gross generalization based on nothing but anecdote people. So (laughs) I'm going to offend how at least half the audience, um, (laughs) that people who have similar situations, similar childhoods in which their parents were divorced at an early age, like me, um, there's just something different about us. And there's like a, a, I'd say one thing I've noticed is like, we're less comfortable in our skin or which could be, and when I say skin, that doesn't necessarily mean our body, but our immediate environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I just feel like there's an edge, like a knife's edge, meaning, you know, harden when you said harden, that's what came to mind for us. And I think that serves, it's both for me at least. And I think for my son who also is one of us, cause we were divorced. Uh, I divorced his mother when, uh, he was seven, just like you. Um, there is a, like, um, I don't know. There isn't, there's an edge. There's a difference. There's a a critical take on the world. We're less comfortable. So we're sort of always, we're, we're outside. I think that's it. I think we become liminal actually. Well, yes, because unlike the other kids. Yeah. You're, you're you're, in between. We're in between liminal. Yeah. Well, literally back and forth between two worlds. right? Right. Like you said, but also noticing the difference between your mother and your father, which you probably don't for a good while longer if they stay together. Mm -hmm. Um, They probably seem as one to you in a sense that they don't, I mean, even if you were to see them naked, you might notice the difference when you're a kid, but not really. You just don't internalize those things in the same way. So even bodily, they seem sort of like one person at a certain point, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, passed back and forth between their arms, you know, and then as you, uh, uh, but, but, but experiencing them as a split thing, you know, but then also, you know, there's that cool shit that was like, Oh my God, two Christmases, you know, oh, <laughs> like that was like, not the for be- me. Uh, <laughs> that was like the best, you know, I was like, yes. fuck, I get two Christmases. I get two birthdays, you know? And, um, that oh, that, was sorry, awesome. that's a question I was going to ask you that I didn't never covered. Your dad was a Christian. No, no, oh, he wasn't. Okay. No, my, my parents were, I was raised irreligiously. So, um, my mom was raised by Christian fundamentalists, oh my God. Gideons, um, mm-hmm. the people that put the little Bibles yeah. in the, and, um, my dad was raised sort of Christian, but it's sort of a mix of Christian and nomadic. I would say gypsy, but that's not the right word. And I realize that can be used as a slur, but, but, but people, something about that word real quickly is people who are <laughs> not, <laughs> people who are not white will sometimes use the word gypsy to refer to a whole group of people. And it's not really a slur. It's just that there's no real word for it Mm -hmm. in, in translation. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, uh, so sort of Christian, but like nomadic supernatural beliefs. And so there was no real equivalent. There was a, a church, you know, nearby that had a lot of Arabic, language stuff going on in it but um was raised nothing not not atheistically not a religious so your mom left the church and yeah was rejected the whole thing or yeah she discovered bertrand russell and, oh you know she this, went all the way yeah. well she, she God, wasn't it's a, just like my father she, bertrand russell we had, a, uh, we had a poster of bertrand russell in our house yeah yeah i well i mean it's so it's interesting i'm <laughs> i mean she wasn't she wasn't an atheist though, you know, which he certainly would have probably encouraged in people. Um, she just sort of thought 
that the critiques were enough to disabuse her of being into the kind of Christianity that her parents were into, you know, I don't think she really held anything against Christianity so much as her parents. She mm -hmm. was able to make that distinction, which a lot of people are not. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and that she wasn't like obsessed with Bertrand Russell, you know, um, which I think is good because I'm not a fan really, but I, <laughs> but uh, she was, she was into him enough that his books were around the house right. and, yeah. you know, she's at least a skeptic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A vigorous skeptic. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with, oh, and the other question that I didn't cover and that I, I got to get back to this, what was the roar in the backyard? Well, that was, that was the devil. Oh, uh huh. But we, <laughs> I told you that that would be the problematic part for you. Why didn't you, why did you say it? you were afraid of me? You were afraid to say it to me? No, I, oh, you actually, I figured it was oh, assumed. I it. Yeah. I, I you, no, you I just figured it was, I didn't hear it. Well, I didn't tell you. I just figured it was assumed. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I come, no. Mm -mm. So, um, yeah, but see, I knew that that part would be problematic. For yeah, you. yeah, yeah. No, I know. So, okay, <laughs> let's get, let's get this on the table too. So yes, yeah, so there, there's all this, uh, I have all this like occult interest, right. right? And I have, you know, for most of my life and that's becoming a much bigger part of my work. Uh, recently, I mean, it's always been really important to me privately, but it's becoming more and more sort of public, a part of my sort of public space. You teach courses on it. I do. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been thinking about what to say to you about that for the last week. <laughs> and here's, here's what I'm going to, here's what I want to say to you okay. about that <laughs> subject. Okay. I am 100% ignorant mm -hmm. about it and prejudiced against it. Yes. So, but I, at least I'm aware of my prejudice and I pride myself on being open, um, also, by the way, I am now very publicly a social constructionist, so which mm. means in part that I believe that any religion, any any spiritual belief is just as real as uh, molecular biology, right? Sure. So, um, do you want to do the occult thing now, or let's do, you do want, it? Do, well, well, I mean, well, we, have, okay, we have so, the bridge, do, right? No, right. okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, that was pretty good. Well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so let's start here, though. When you were, how, you were eight when that happened? Something like that, okay. seven, eight, yeah. So how did you conceive of that then, at that moment? I thought it was the devil. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, but I, but I, I didn't know what that meant exactly. I have a better idea of what that could mean. Oh, because now. you had seen the, what was it, your brother's? Dungeons and Dragons book, and I had just right. said the name, which I am still loath to say. Um, well, this, oh, this Dungeons one particular, and Dragons? No, this oh, one oh, particular oh, the name, name of, the of it, yes. So, um, and, and, uh, and so I, I no, I don't think I. What does it say begin it. with? <laughs> not gonna say it, but <laughs> it's not that I've never. I've said it too. I just it's like. So I, first of all, I gotta say this. Yeah. I swear to God, if I were an Arab American porn star, yeah. you would not be able to tell us apart because uh, uh. <laughs> because my brother, uh -huh. guess what he did? He played Dungeons and Dragons. I, yeah. this is unbelievable. Okay, did it begin with a C? No. Oh, okay. Then I don't know. Then I have no idea. C. I, see, I don't actually, I didn't really do D and D. Oh, I see. I like toyed with it for a minute and I was like, this is not for me. Uh huh. But, um, um but I do want, I want to talk about that too. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Well, we should talk so about that. So you played it. Dragons. Yeah. With oh, my brother, but my brother's 13 years older than me. So uh -huh. it was sort of across a gap, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was the way for us to hang out. Um, mm -hmm. you weren't like in a community of D and D. Players. No, no, no. And that's, you know what? That's I mean, what my that brother did, does. It, that didn't even really, did that even really exist then? I mean, it was mm -hmm. so new. I mean, it, you, that's you what it did. Always was. Yeah. But it, but it, it had just a, it's not like you went like, there was no space like where you went to like the comic book store in the back room and played with like 20 people. You sure. know what I mean? It's not, yeah. it's a different thing now, yeah. you know, yeah. the way it's it arranges. It's a fascinating stuff. subculture though. Isn't I, th it? I think it's so fascinating. And I think actually. I've always been, you know, I've always known about it because of my brother and yeah. he, he's all, he's been all in his entire life. I mean, since he was seven yeah. uh, till now. He's yeah. now 49, <laughs> and I think he still does it on a regular basis. And he's part of the whole elaborate community, yeah. and that's what they talk about. And his way of interacting with the rest of the world yeah. is often through that. So he'll make references. Well, to, yeah. and, but it's also interesting how they, there's particular things that that subculture is attracted to, and it's so consistent over time and place. <laughs> so that like when my brother travels to another state, mm -hmm. he'll find someone, and they'll immediately who's of that mm -hmm. world and they'll immediately have 10 things to talk about. And it's like Star Trek, um, <laughs> some forms of martial arts, uh, every science fiction movie and book mm -hmm. ever, 
uh, in in all the role playing games. Yeah, and, like a, they can awesome, talk. Huh? And oh, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. For well, some that reason. that's that's the greatest story what's ever his, told. But, yeah, uh, Joss Whedon. Yeah, so they all can talk <laughs> forever and ever about those subjects, uh, and it's so odd. It's like some kid in Seattle can talk to a kid in Miami, you know, instantly. They have this whole and like, how does that that subculture crosses time and space like that it's so and it's so consistent you know i think is so cool too is, <laughs> is that the, the, so the way that we sort of look in at D and like how people sort of like get lost in it and remember all the like fears in the 80s about the satanic panic like people are going to get like possessed by playing dungeons and dragons yeah. which apparently, i mean in berkeley apparently we're, we're did, not too worried about that did happen yeah, yeah. in my life right. but i feel like that's how people look in uh people who don't understand postmodern philosophy look at postmodern philosophers like they're all playing Dungeons and Dragons and just creating these terms and mm -hmm. and this yeah. sort of like fantasy world in which they're mm -hmm. like too absorbed into see outside of and in fact that is how it runs in academia a lot but the people that are mm -hmm. really like the big thinker they're not like that totally. they're actually brilliant people and well i think what you want to say, I think you want to say <laughs> is, is that um that they are doing things that actually have an effect that really have a real meaning in what the rest of the world consider to be the real world. Right. right. So the postmodern ideas actually can and have shaped the way so-called real world operates. Yes. That's, that's my point. In fact, what I say to my students yeah. is it's, it's actually a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. And I really mean that. So if you make claims that are rooted in nature, if you make essentialist claims, claims that this behavior that attitude this way of being uh are determined by nature are essential in a in the nature of something mm -hmm. right they can't be you can't change them right there's nothing you can do about it because they come from nature then we gotta we gotta erect social structures right to deal with that we can't you know there's not so one of the here's a few examples right the most classic examples of course are black people are intellectually inferior and capable only of manual labor, well, and therefore, A, they have to be taken care of, and B, they should probably be enslaved, mm -hmm. okay? Classic, women. Uh, they, they are naturally determined to be mothers and wives, um, and so we got to make sure that they stay there. And if they venture out of the home, then we're going to let them know that, at the very least, they're being unnatural. Mm -hmm. So there's shame, and on top of that, we're going to erect policies that keep them in the home, right? by keeping them out of professions, by keeping them out of the public sphere. Um, Muslims, uh, Arabs, you know, it's like, well, this is a thing. It's just part of who they are. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do about it, right? So they're going to continue to try to fly planes into our buildings because that's just who they are in their essence. Mm -hmm. It's all, That gets all muddied because they confuse, you know, ideology, which is religion and race. But, but, but Muslims uniquely confuse those two things for some reason. But there that's is what sort people of a funny say, thing. That's what people say. But in a sense, they <laughs> do actually racialize yes, that religion because their yeah. claim is that there's nothing you can do about it, right? Like, right? like the belief that black people can do nothing about the fact, the scientific fact that <laughs> right. they're dumber than we are, yeah. right? Um, so, and... So that has resulted in, oh, <laughs> what has it resulted in? It's resulted in people saying, well, there's nothing we can do about those people. They're going to continue to fly planes in our buildings, so we've got to kill them because right. that's the only way to deal with them. There's, right. there's no policy change. There's no idea change. and Nothing else we can do. We've got to kill them. They're those, like psychopaths, right? Yes, and that's where you divide modernist ideas and postmodernist ideas. Those are modern. Yeah. That's why it's called postmodern. That whole way of thinking is what we refer to as the, moder as like the modernist like idea right. is – there are these essential claims, these things that are essentially true. The British Empire is better than everybody mm -hmm. else. Exactly. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's also moral. They're moral claims. Yes, right. Exactly. Well, that's, that's my favorite, right? Which is when people go moral on it, when they make essentialist moral claims. Yes. Right. That, that, um, Western democracy is just naturally better. Right. <laughs> right. And there's so, nothing you can do about it. It's just a fact. How about this? See, I'm, I'm really struck by the idea that you f that you had an experience with the devil yeah. when you were seven years old yeah and you're now the devil <laughs> you became yeah. the devil yes but I did and then, and then the immediate for me the contradiction mm -hmm. that immediately comes up is that you cried when you first encountered the devil mm -hmm. you were scared of him mm -hmm. but then you became the devil you did you became you know certainly in this culture one of the worst things you can become mm -hmm. in multiple ways right you you pretty much hit the trifecta or whatever um, sodomite occultist smart person arab i mean it's just all over the horrible and, place and uh Queer. And, whore, and whore yeah 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 right um awful right 
and oh and um intellectual <laughs> the worst <laughs> the worst of all damn near perfect and you live in hollywood too <laughs> um so no i just i just find that fascinating right it, you know what i mean like yeah. it's because i've been um i've been called that i mean i i again i i resonate that resonates with me like i i am always simultaneously attracted to being the devil in a sense yeah like calling people out and calling things out and just being kind of cutting against the grain all the time Mm -hmm. like i just there's something about me that needs to do that i can't just let things go that i i can't let anything go like everything goes through this very (laughs) fine mesh sieve Uh right which i understand can be annoying or enraging for other people i get that so i try to rein it in i try to be careful with it but I just, I don't know where it comes from, but that's, it's a devilish thing, right? Because you are the opposite. You're the antagonist. You're the et- eternal antagonist to the world. It's, it's, it's one of those uh, things but, where, sorry. Yeah. Oh, and then no, I was just going to say, no, good. so that's, so I am, but I am all also always feeling bad about it and feeling hmm. scared about it and feeling shame about it. And, you know, like in the last week, so <laughs> since Rogan, the Rogan thing, uh, I've been called uh, a faggot, a cunt, a pussy, and then that's easy. But the stuff that actually gets me, which is, again, said by people that I don't really respect, but it still gets me, is like, you're the stupidest person on the earth, and you don't know anything about science, and you don't know anything about the real world, and yeah. you're the dumbest person, and right, and you're an asshole, and you're a smug, um, you name it, uh, superior, you know, intellectual, blah, blah, blah. You'd look down on us, all that. And, um, so, and I, but I actually worry about that stuff. I can't just brush it off. Let's, 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 Even though it comes from cavemen. Yeah. Right. I don't, yeah. it bugs me. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like, and I feel like maybe, I don't know. I don't know if that's true for you or not, but like yeah. I'm, it's a, I'm ambivalent always about this position. I find myself in all the time that I put myself into. <laughs> I want, I just want to make a declarative statement right okay. now. Yeah. Scientists and science minded people who are not into postmodern ideas are not scientists. They're charlatans. They're fakes. So quite the opposite that everybody's saying. Because here's the thing. So when people are like, you don't understand science, you don't want... No, 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 no. Those people don't understand science. Because science at its heart is interested and invested in these questions. And real scientists, and I've been around them because I studied science for three years in grad school. I did my due diligence with it. (laughs) Um, They care about this shit. Um, real scientists say there's no such thing as objective reality. There you go. Yeah. They're interested in that question. There you go. And they could be quantum physicists. They could be biologists. There's this big divide between physics and biology, which is stupid. But people who, and, and, and largely a lot of these people who are making these scientific truth claims are biologists, often phony biologists like Richard Dawkins, who is a zoologist who therefore knows very little about most of biology because it's most living things are bacteria. He doesn't know almost anything about that world and creates an entire version of evolution that excludes the most <laughs> prevalent types of organisms on the planet. So we'll, we'll get back. Well, to I was that. just going to say, yeah, sorry. But I mean, I think that's such an important point. Okay. And I, I love that what you just said. Um, so I know, I know nothing at all about zoology, yeah. you know, biology, you name it. I'm, I'm a total ignoramus about most fields of science and people are like, see, that proves that you're wrong about what you were saying about yeah. objective reality. No, I, anyone who says the science is settled. Yeah. I think you're right, Connor. Like that is not a scientist because yeah. that means, that means science stops. Totally. There's no need for science. When people say that climate change is a, is a settled question, mm-hmm. then I ask, then why do you want federal funding for more climate change research? Science, right? Research. <laughs> Hello. I thought yeah. we. I thought every, of course not. Any ask any serious climate change scientist, no matter what their position is on it, they'll say, "Oh my God, there are nothing but new questions." Right. You know, and and, and they're constantly revising it. And so anyone who who wants to look into this further, the the, the first text to start with, I think, is Thomas Kuhn. Mm-hmm. Thomas Kuhn, The Structures of Scientific Revolutions, yeah. right? Which I read in college and blew my mind away. Although I didn't quite get it then, I really got it later. And all he does is he just looks at the history of scientific claims. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one minute the sun revolves around the earth, and then the next minute the earth revolves around the sun. One minute the earth is flat, the next minute it's a right. com- perfect sphere. Oh, and then, now it's sort of oblong, and that's even that's changing. Gravity people are always like, well, what, gravity doesn't exist then? And I say, well, you know what, as a matter of fact, just I think just last year or something, 
these astrophysicists totally. saw that gravity is working in a different way in certain other constellations or something that they, that that grab the theory of gravity predicts. So yeah, but you're right. I mean, to me, like that's what makes a scientist. That's the starting point, and it, it's is that there is nothing settled. Nothing ever can be settled. All you do is continue to ask questions and explore things. And 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 for all his all his bombastic craziness that I don't agree with sometimes I have this sort of love hate with this guy Massimo I always pronounce his name wrong but Massimo Pugliucci or whatever and he he writes about distinguishing bunk from real science right he's kind of a debunker skeptic kind of guy right. he irritates the fuck out of me sometimes but something that he says which I think is really valuable and I think people who are skeptical of science should actually take this to heart um, is that you don't necessarily have a right to argue with the consensus as a non-scientist. There are such things as consensuses within the sciences. So it doesn't matter. So, so in one sense, we, we should put aside, just for a second, <laughs> the idea that science is never settled. There, are, there is consensus between scientists that is valuable for certain projects. Mm -hmm. Now, let me sort of take it away from him and add the thing you're saying in. However... <laughs> That doesn't mean that the discussion doesn't belong to all of us in some way. It doesn't belong to me to go on a public, uh, hmm. on a public stage and tell people that some that that climate change isn't happening, right? But we but we have to understand that there is real debate and real um, shifting of. Uh, at least certain details in that whole field that's interesting, that's valuable amongst them. And also that people are, as you said, invested in finding out more. And there are reasons they're invested in finding out more. Mm -hmm. And now it might sound like I contradicted myself because I just said Richard Dawkins' version of evolution is bullshit. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and I'm making, not... In other and, words, that you're making a truth claim. Yes, and I'm yeah. not a scientist. And right. I just said, oh, well, we don't have a... You know, that's, but his, his view actually isn't scientific consensus. So there's also this whole other version that we of science that we have to sort of take into account, which is that the public face of science and scientific ideas and pop science and science journalism is very often not what scientists are discussing and talking about anymore. So this sort of dumb, outdated idea that random genetic mutation meets natural selection is how evolution works. Most biologists don't believe in that anymore. Richard Dawkins is an artifact. And yet, because he has such a public voice as this sort of politically positioned person who has a very specific mission in the public sphere, we accept that that's the scientific explanation. And we have the duty to also ask questions like that and therefore send our minds elsewhere to go do more reading, go do more research, ask more questions, all that kind of stuff. And it reveals to us something new. So I think that I think that we have a whole set of problems ahead of us, and some are scientific, some are political, some are reality claims, some are philosophical claims. There are many moral panics going on right now, but one of them that I think is especially interesting and understudied is the um, panic about the the so-called crisis of expertise. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's this book out recently by what's his name, Tom Nichols, called I think it's called The Death of Expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, that's a terrible thing. And for me, that's it's, it's thing. cause for celebration. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and again, this is why I'm a historian, because all you got to do is look at the history of this question. And that is, it's about a hundred, it's a, about a 150 year old thing, expertise. It's lasted about 150 years, right? And it was invented in the late 19th century when the church was, was pushed out in Europe and America as sort of the source of authority on things. And it was replaced by scientists in terms of the physical world and, you know, and even psychology and even sexuality and all these things, right? So-called scientists move in. Medical doctors, psychologists, biologists, sociologists. So scientists, broadly speaking. And they establish their own associations, their own institutions. Each one of them has its own. There's the American Sociological Association. There's the American Psychological Association. There's the American Historians Association. You name it, right? And they set rules as to who gets to be included, and then there's institutions called universities where they get employed and they have the same rules. So they're all in league together. And they say, if you have such this idea, you don't get to, you don't get a card to our, to our, to our club and you don't get to be an expert. We're the experts. Mm -hmm. We're the ones we went to Harvard or Yale and we're a member of the ASA <clears throat> and we know what's true or at least, you know, close enough. Uh, so they've, it's been a monopoly 
And by the way, they've gotten government support in doing this as well because the federal government has propped up these universities and colleges and been working with these professional associations all along. Uh, and the thing they've been saying is, you know, if you have, if you're a normal person without the particular credentials, with the, without the particular education, and even without the particular ideas, you're not an expert and you, you don't get to, no one should listen to you. And by the way, and then so the media is, has always been a major part of that until recently, mm-hmm. right? So the New York Times, I was just saying this to someone, uh, just until about five years ago, if the New York Times didn't write a, a glowing review of your book, you did not have a career as an author, basically, unless mm-hmm. you did like romance fiction or something. Uh, so these gatekeepers were there, which were in league with those associations. Do you think the New York Times ever asked someone outside of the American Sociological Association to review a book on sociology? Mm-hmm. No, of course not. Same with science. Um, it's one big monopoly, has been. Now, they're right to panic because right now, all that stuff is, in fact, un- it's being eroded. I was going to say under assault. That's not really true. It's sort of just eroding. People are just moving away from it. And Trump is just one, one actually small example of that, right? Um, so the internet, blogs, podcasts has changed the whole media landscape. So we're doing this right now, and thousands of people are going to listen to this no matter what the New York Times thinks, no matter what the American Historical Association thinks, right? Um, and science is, is changing, too. People have access to scientific information. People have access to research now. Click of a button. You can read pretty much anything you want. Um, and they're starting to ask questions. The, the plebes, you know, the non-experts. Well, I can understand why the so-called experts are absolutely freaking out and why they want to get Hillary Clinton back in office to set things right, you know, uh, right? Because th- that's where they come from. This, this principle, there's a principle, basic psychoanalysis principle, that there's a tension between experts and enjoyment and like people who are just like enjoyable and fun. Okay, I'm just talking about it in plain terms. Like either you get brainy smurf who's like, well, actually this and such and such and such and such is true. And they're like, they seek their authority through telling you what is actually true. Or you get the people that are really just sort of fun to hang out with. And like, you know, they enjoy life. They're going to throw a good party. Who gives a fuck what they think? Like you're having, you know, there's a tension between those two things. I'm making a very simple, you know, concept, but it's like, we're we're starting (laughs) We're starting to really rebel against Brainy Smart, right? As as you point out, the the expert, the person that has authority by knowing facts, knowing information, and we're seeing the erosion of that in so many ways, whether it's fake news or whatever. One way we're seeing it is while Trump became president, because we thought we 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 are excited about a narrative about making America great again. We're excited about a narrative of the sort of freedom of. Uh, express your religion, express your whatever, in whatever way you want, like this is what Trump's promising, you know. Um, another way we're seeing it is this sort of uh, something that comes up when you talk a lot, uh, is this social justice warrior thing on campus where um, you're starting to see how irrelevant universities are becoming by the kinds of conflicts that are happening on them that are being so led by the students. And one thing that people don't talk about in those conflicts at all is that the students are saying, we're going to be the ones that determine our fate and our destiny Mm -hmm. in this system now. Mm -hmm. We're going to be saying, because guess what? Your expertise about like the sort of you know, like 19th century women writers who had syphilis and lint in their hair is not valuable to us anymore. (laughs) What we want is to be the ones that guide this based on our experience and what makes us feel good and what makes us feel bad. (laughs) So they're two sides of the same coin. And, and of course, then like the battles become these really pedantic things because they're really about comfort. They're about what feels good. But at the base of that, I think, is another version of people deciding that experts are irrelevant and also sensing that the kind of education they're getting from experts is now irrelevant. You might have people that are really great in universities. There are still plenty of people who are amazing professors sure, in universities. Course. 
They're so few and far between, though. <laughs> they 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 always kind of were, but the information that came from the shitty ones wasn't available. Right. Now that it is, right. it's really exposed how uh, how yeah. useless they are. And as you've pointed out many times, the hiring committees are people wanting people like themselves because no one wants to be if they're not worth anything set in stark contrast to someone you know i mean that happens at lots of jobs like you go in and you pre present your best face and then you know like once you get in like you become <laughs> you, be, you you reveal yourself to be different that's what people who are good professors do they go in for the interview and they're like yeah sure i like these ideas that everybody's talking about right now and then yeah. they get in and they're like all right actually no like fuck you i have these <laughs> but you have to do that to be a good professor you have to lie at first absolutely you know right to get tenure certainly yeah yeah so i so i think there are all these versions of it and it's actually located in places where you might not at first identify that this impetus to overthrow the experts those experts should be gone the way that we decide to overthrow the experts and what that decision and the actions we take does to us as people is really important because the ways that we're doing it, I think, are really damaging to us. I think the ways that we're dealing with these kinds of politics on campuses, the way that we're, uh, the way that we, I'm just talking about collectively as a culture, the way that we're sort of deifying either Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or whatever, I think that these things are extremely damaging. Mm -hmm. However, um, the impulse seems very similar. To yeah. Me. So you just made me rethink my whole thing about campus politics and what's going <laughs> on there. Um, and so, or maybe put together different ideas that I've been having, but you know, it's a reformulation. So it's great. Um, so I, I, I love what you said about how students in a sense, what's going on on campuses is, is that they're rebelling against the experts, mm -hmm. right? That they're rebelling against the, the authority figures, there, professors, I suppose, and maybe the administrators. Um, I think that's true to some extent. Now, of course, there are many professors who are basically ringleading all mm -hmm. this stuff, right? I mean, and they're fault. So basically, it's sort of, there's the good professors, there's the virtuous, justice-oriented professors who get the kids right. their information and their language, right, and their anger in some ways, or they direct their anger. Um, and then there's the bad professors, the ones who are supposedly <laughs> racist or sexist or whatever, you know, homophobic, you name it. And then they kind of that's the fight on the campus. But it is. It is a rebellion. The difference is that... And you're right about this, that, you know, until about 20 to 30 years ago, uh, th there was no, well, until the 1960s, there was no rebellion at all on college campuses, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was just this deference to authority. Mm -hmm. That's what you were supposed to do. There was not even a question. Oh, my God, of course these people know it's right. So you just follow You may them. not even ask questions in class. But it's still true, though, yeah. to some to a large extent, you know, um, that most, certainly most of my students just assume that I'm right <laughs> about stuff. It's kind of amazing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, because I'm a professor and I have a PhD or whatever, I'm or I'm just in this classroom and I'm standing in front of them and they just assume that I'm right. Um, not all, but I think generally speaking, that's probably true. But um, I do think that is, I think that there is a change now because you do see them, students at least, more willing than ever to, to not just question authority, but rebel openly against it. Now, um, in 99% of the cases, I don't, side with them on what they're rebelling about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to go where they want to take us. But here's the thing. I have always taken the position that students should be treated like consumers uh, in that they should, what you said, they should choose what they learn. They should choose what they study. They should choose what classes are on offer. They should choose who their teachers are, right? Radical concept. Ask a professor what they think about that, they'll freak out. They, they, this is the worst thing you can propose to them. Mm. They know that they, uh, they know that they know what students should learn. They're sure of that, and they're very sure that students don't know what mm -hmm. they should learn. Right, so they treat them like children. Well, it's a pater It's a completely openly, it's openly paternalistic system. Totally. Right, and so. Um, when I say consumers, that's all I mean. I don't mean that we should make Harvard into McDonald's. I'm just saying that wh why is it different than all other businesses and industries? <laughs> Think about it, right? Where the consumer, because that's what they are, they're paying these people to give them services. It's the only industry in which the customer is not allowed to make choices. Because it's an extension <laughs> of the obedience industry of public schooling in our, in our culture, right? I mean, it's like that's the model that we continue to use into the, and that's that public school model is sick. I love what you said about your first memory, your, your 
the first thing you remember about your public school experience was what was it? Oh, that I uh, I realized that um, in in our previous conversation we talked about this that I realized I had a moment where I realized that I had to raise my hand to ask a question or go to the bathroom, and that makes you um, quite disliked by the people in power because you just have this thought what uh, what yeah and um suddenly everything just sort of pops out into this new sort of version of things yeah. and uh, what why you know i I don't get it. And then you, you really start seeing this sort of tightly wound system of obedience. And I, I almost failed out of, you know, high school. Um, there's a, one reason why I didn't. And it was because of my, as far as I know, this is what was explained to me because of my IQ, they weren't allowed to ever hold me back. Oh, really? So there was a system after you're tested for your IQ, you're placed in gifted, a sort of gifted category. Do you know what your IQ is? Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't okay. know what mine is. I, I've never been told. I might, but I don't even like saying it because I, I no, have You don't my have own to say the number, but do you know what it is? Yeah. Or have you been told the number? I was told when I was younger. Yeah. It might not be I've that never anymore. been told. Yeah. It's one, maybe it's one of the reasons I'm so skeptical of IQ generally. Yeah. And, and I just... <laughs> and I don't... Because I don't care. Because, you know, I'm in the position now where it just really doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, if you told me it was 80, I would be fine like it right. wouldn't bother me at all right and if you told me it was 180 i would be like that's bullshit <laughs> yeah it measures it measures something right but it but yeah what, what is it sure then? but yeah. but i think that the i think that what you're talking about i have a question about this about students choosing no okay. it's not because i take the side of the professors who absolutely know however i wonder if we let people choose because of the context of our culture that we have right now they'll just choose to become experts so mm. in other words, like I'm going to sort of filter like that. This is the thing I've always sort of love about what is supposed to be a liberal arts education is like, we're going to give you lots of stuff. Right. And that because of the way culture operates right now, and because of the intense encouragement to expertise that people will just choose this like path. And I, I don't have a problem with that necessarily. Or, I mean, if people want to do that, go ahead and fucking do it. However, I wonder if that's a conflict in, what you're saying uh that they will then become experts yeah self self-described self um designated experts that yeah what you mean well sure so what though i mean if you don't have to believe them you don't have to follow what they say i see but but i'm just talking about what we're gonna at least we i mean every the world transition. is already full of those people yeah, right? right everybody's a, a right. self-designated expert on something yeah. or many things right and it's like we sift that out and we choose who we want to believe um no yeah. it's it's remarkable so here's the thing I have thrown that idea out there about students as consumers, treating them as such. And so far, everyone <laughs> disagrees with me. <laughs> everyone. Here's the thing. Social justice warrior type professors totally disagree with me, of course, because sure. then the bad ideas come in, you know, if yeah. you let the students choose. Um, conservatives disagree with me. To, mm -hmm. Well, think about it, right? The, the modern, so-called modern university is modeled after medieval institutions right where priests taught the church taught that ch the church was the was the sovereign in those universities those, se those seminaries right um libertarians have disagreed with me on this i couldn't believe that i said are you kidding me you guys are about you guys are about consumer choice in everything else but not this because their problem is they think if you let the, the students decide what ideas they will learn, they will learn the social justice ideas, the uh, socialist ideas, the bad ideas, same as the conservatives. It's same, funny. It's, they all, they all have this anxiety. They're all threatened. They by all, freedom. yep. They all, yep. Isn't that funny? They all have my freedom. They all have this anxiety. <laughs> Sound like George Bush. For a second. Yep. About letting kids study what they want to study. <laughs> Jeez, man. Yeah. There are some positions that are just <laughs> universally unpopular. Like I, I don't know if I believe this or not, but I sometimes just say that I don't believe that school should be funded by the government <laughs> like public schooling should be funded by the government and people get really like i think universally people fucking hate that idea wait you, know? you think it should not be i don't I, i'm not or, i'm not tied to the idea it's just something i throw out oh, every once in a while to see it immediately okay yeah okay, so, oh my okay. god you're, you're just preaching to the choir okay okay good okay, okay good well <laughs> see okay then i'm wrong i thought that everybody i hate just public education oh no i mean it's a libertarian position so is it oh yeah sure yeah oh, okay yeah. oh yeah all right totally all right yeah. So yeah. that so the idea of libertarians is that it should be funded by corporations no, or just not at all. Just just leave it just alone. Just whatever you do. Just get the government out. Yeah, I see. And then yeah. whoever fills, you know, whoever takes over can take over, but Got you it. know, and it's not even about no one can take over, that's the thing, right? Yeah. Because sure there will be private 
companies that do it and there'll be McDonald's might have a school, but yeah. there'll be, you know, a billion Christian schools and a billion socialist, you know, little schools and then everything will be, it'll be all the flowers will bloom. Right. Right. Uh, at least that's the theory, but the main, the position is just get the government out. I see. And I am a hundred percent clear <laughs> on that. Having been through okay. public school for 13 years, having seen my son go through public school sure. for now it's uh, 11 years, hating every minute for me, hating every minute for him. Yep. And he's with me on this. So it's just that we have no choice because the government has a monopoly and yeah. we can't afford to, to spend $50,000 a year at Crossroads in Santa Monica where the, where the celebrities kids go, right. the private school. Um, so it's, you know, it, no, so, so that, so that's good. So I, was ig- I was ignorant. I was ignorant of the libertarian position. Um, mm-hmm. but, it, I, but I was just trying to say there are some positions like the one that you just brought up about people directing their own education that oh, just seem to be universally in the, in the town you live in. You yeah. Know? Oh yeah. I'm sure you, you will have a hard time yeah. finding in mo- it's a minority position for sure. Yeah. You know, and in liberal Los Angeles, it's, yeah, it's a weird thing. It's a bad thing. It's actually your mean person. You, la- you <laughs> lack compassion because, well, because of course the poor will then be uneducated. Yeah. Because they're so well educated now in those public schools. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And the, and all, and also the rich are so educated into like great, the great value systems yeah, that it's working lead great. them to no, treat others so well. Yeah. It's so fantastic. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, just really go, <laughs> please go to Compton high school, everyone right now and see how it's going down there. Uh huh. What is, what is actually going on at Compton high well, school? I mean, go to, Ka- go to Kazakwa high school though, dude. It's like, it's a prison where, where I, where I grew up, even though it was sort of, it wasn't wealthy but it was well to do enough it was middle class enough i had a teacher kick me in the stomach in the middle of class oh yeah i had a, a teacher tell me she was going to send me back to syria on a camel i if i didn't shut up i had kids bullying me i you know i mean it's just it, it was for certain people in those systems it's also just total hell unless you decide to go along with the fucking brutalist like it, well i like brutalist architecture so <laughs> br- brutal bullshit uh, just like sort of current of those kinds of places. Yeah. Now, of course, there are always people in those systems, in university systems, in public schooling systems that are awesome. There's always like the, Engli- the, the English teacher or the music teacher or whatever. That's great. So it's like people get all, all upset like, oh, you're shitting on teachers. It's like, no. But like the ones that are good are the exception, you know? And yeah, so- it's like, a, it's funny, you know, I, when I go through TSA, which I have to do every week now, <laughs> um, I have a you know grudge against TSA generally, um, but I I sort of think hmm should I hate all the agents you know <laughs> so, no and I don't I mean I don't know what to think about the genuinely uh-huh. Uh-huh. sort of nice people who treat me well um, who are TSA agents who hassle me and make me miss my flight which just happened actually yesterday but um you know but then there's the guys who are the usually guys who are the um, have the little bit of power and love using it mm-hmm. and love <laughs> in, you know being sort of the <laughs> superior to you in that moment um, but. You know, I guess I just would think about them the way I th- would think of prison guards. Oh. Um, are those evil people? I mean, I don't even think cops are evil. I don't think anyone's evil, of course, since I'm a postmodernist. I don't think there's such a thing as evil. They're human beings, you know, and they're just constructs and whatever. But um, um, I don't, you know, I guess I'm a little at least annoyed with them because these are educated people who should know better. Here's the thing, guys. Look, if I don't send my son to a school, I go to prison. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> no one even ever, that never occurs to it's people. Crazy. That's yeah. actually the, it's, it's compulsory, right? Yeah. I go to prison. If I don't send them to a school, I can send them to a private school, but of course I can't afford a private school. So therefore poor people, all poor people, pretty much most of them at least have to send their kids to these public schools. Okay. Sure. Or they go to prison. Okay. That's, that's the deal. It's at a point of a gun. No shit. Now, um, so public education is in an essence of a vaccination can and can the children leave the school during the day no mm-hmm. no they cannot they have to stay there from 7 a.m or whatever to 8 a.m to 3 8 a.m to 3 p.m every day mm-hmm. if if they do leave the school what will happen to them if the police catch them mm-hmm. they will catch them arrest them put them in their car and take them back to the school if they do it twice or three times or five times we have places for those kids too it's called juvenile detention centers, mm-hmm. which are jails, right? So they go to prison too, right? So it's completely compulsory. It is, it is uh, enforced literally at the point of a gun because the cops who come to arrest you have guns, right? Um, so then where does that leave us as to who the teachers are, <laughs> right? right? Uh, sure sounds like a day prison to me, like a day camp, day prison, but it's you have to go. And there's guards there. They're the ones who 
report on you if you leave the class. And you have to perform while you're there too. Sure. So you don't, you don't, you're not allowed any really big range of behaviors while you're in that place. You have to sit in a chair and be quiet. Um, you have to absorb the information. I mean, uh, clockwork orange style, keep your eyes open, take everything in that's being like sent to you Mm -hmm. and you have to prove that you took the information in. So it's, it's, it's all this sort of like, and, and I mean, I think (laughs) it's really that whole, um, that whole system of obedience that carries over into universities, um, that carries over into the workforce. I mean, it's just from as soon as you can think really you're thrown into it Mm -hmm. and we should be really questioning that to begin with. So you you know know what happened when you were five years old in kindergarten? Yeah, you did. That's exactly what you did. And so the question you asked in your own mind, I suppose you may not have articulated it outside, but outside yourself was, you know, why do I have to raise my hand to go to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to raise my hand? Why do I have to get permission to speak? Mm -hmm. Right. That is actually a monkey wrench in the whole system. Yep. Right. Because so far, you know, there've been very, very few kids like you, right. Who at least would continue to ask that question. Mm -hmm. It's been a bunch of kids who asked that question on the first day of kindergarten, Mm -hmm. right. (laughs) But they get broken like horses, right. Right. We put them in the pen and we don't let them leave. And if the horse tries to jump out of the pen, we whip it until it goes back into the pen. Right. So most kids learn quickly. <laughs> they, get, they get contained. Those, those questions get contained or repressed, and then they're okay. But you didn't. You kept asking that question. You kept having that question. At least you kept feeling that question, seems to me. It's a question that You continue to now. be the devil yeah. in that system. Yeah. 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 It's a question that stays with me now. It's the question that, like I said, punk rock Mm. allowed me to ask. It allowed me to be the person that was asking that question. I mean, the essential sort of line of punk rock, the the sort of the, the, the base of it. And this is why it's not enough, but the base of it is fuck you. I won't do what you tell me. Right. I love how you said it's not enough. Yes. That's my position on punk rock. Well, I mean, just resistance is not enough. Exactly. Um, Resistance is, I mean, we'll just give give you the sense that your identity comes from the thing that you're resisting and therefore you always need it Ooh. and therefore you can never let it go massive huge move right there yeah. i love that so, <laughs> love that did you hear what he just said <laughs> see that's the thing when you identify yourself as a victim um well you kind of did a little bit differently but that's essentially the same argument right it's like then and you're seeking you're appealing to the oppressor right um to change things for the better for you that means you are dependent on the oppressor it's it's like it's like today when um for your identity today or two two days ago or whatever Stephen Colbert I don't know when this is going to come out but Stephen Colbert made a joke about he went a long rant against Donald Trump and said one thing in there about like how Trump was Putin's cock holster or something like that <laughs> mm-hmm. right I mean the whole the, Russia thing is fucking stupid. The, but, well, the, home, but the, the, the queering of Trump has been really interesting, right? Right. The, the whole but, making him Putin's bitch, et cetera. Is, yes. Is really it's, it has its own sort of yeah. thing. But, and, and, I, and I'm not, the whole Russian thing I think is boring and stupid, but, the, but, but the thing that's interesting to me about it, why I'm bringing it up is all these gay people lost their shit about, it. they were like, this is homophobic. I can't believe you made that homophobic joke. No. And for me, it's just like, what, how invested are you in your own identity that this person who, by the way, years ago ridiculed the biggest war criminal in the world, George W. Bush, to his face for an hour, looked in, was standing right there and just fucking made fun of him. You can watch the video. It's amazing. Michael Colbert? Yes. Yeah. Um, and is now with the huge audience, like really just in a national <laughs> site, like taking the president apart. That, by the way, has this whole cabinet of anti-LGBT people mm-hmm. like surrounding him, mm-hmm. and he says something using a centuries-old tactic, which is using sexual imagery to humanize people in power and therefore remove their power. And the thing that they picked out hmm. was, oh, this is homophobic. Oh, you're actually defending the queering of Trump in this case. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, to I me, see, it, yeah. to me, in the context of the whole thing, I just thought. I mean, I certainly wasn't offended by it. I just thought it's interesting that people used that tactic. Right? wasn't It because wasn't a great. wasn't a great joke. No, I just a, think it's. It was yeah. a bad joke. It, but but yeah. it wasn't. But it wasn't homophobic in the sense that everybody was saying it was. It's like, look, all these people in the LGBT movement. Well, especially let's just say the G movement. Really, 
worked so hard to make gay quote unquote normal. So it's like, okay, so if someone's evidencing that gay is normal now by just making a sex joke and thinking that gay is like, like normal enough that now we're just making sex jokes. It could have been, I mean, if, if there were a female leader or whatever, like that joke might have had a sort of different resonance, but it just seemed to me like gay is normal to Stephen Colbert. So he just says this thing as he's in the process, this long rant of insulting Trump to millions of people being able to view this thing. I mean, it's a pretty bold thing to do. Not that I think Stephen Colbert is some amazing hero or whatever, but it just it, it showed me the investment of a certain kind of identity that people had that even in that context, it was so impermissible because it somehow seemed like a threat to the identity of, uh, of certain people. Yeah. Well, so I that, mean, I, that was a resistance move that I just, it, that's a moment where I'm like, resistance is not enough. This is not, this person, Colbert was doing something creative, not just resisting. Mm -hmm. This is something different. But I mean, I would say that Colbert was doing something that was essentially anti-gay, right? Because he's saying that being a, what is it, cock holster? What is that? Yes. Okay, being a cock holster is a bad thing, right? And so to me, the queer move, meaning like queer theorists, queer politics, yeah. is to say, sure, fine, but we don't, cons we don't care that's fine or or we think it's a good thing but it's certainly not a negative thing and i think what you're saying and this is where i think i agree with you is that the non-queer gays right uh -huh. the mainstream gays gay ink whatever you want to call them right <laughs> liberal gays um they're only concerned with the insult so it becomes right. what they do is they actually they actually confirm in a sense that being gay is bad because yes because why why else would it hurt you right. to say that gay sex which he was referring to basically right is bad. I mean, it, right? That's the only way it would hurt. But I actually, then the only thing I would add to that, because I agree exactly with what you're saying, and I okay. think you explained it better than I do, is that he's making, was that somehow gay sex was, that it was about gay sex in that case? To me, I don't actually think it was. I think it was about sex. I think sex is a mm. bigger container than sexuality. Well, it's sort of a larger thing. And so the, the focus, it, it was a bad joke, and so it sort of fell flat. But the idea was, again, there's this really long history, hundreds of years old, stretching at least back to the 16th century, of people using sexual imagery, sexual jokes, to make fun of leaders. And it wasn't just gay or straight or whatever. It was just sexual jokes to right. humanize people who seem beyond the pale. And yeah. also, notice that all, a lot of those gay people that were pissed off about that comment were like, yeah, piss tape. We're going to come out with a piss tape that like, <laughs> finally like, shows that Trump's like, into piss. And there's like, a video of hookers pissing on him. Like They didn't care about sexuality then. So in that case, it just becomes this weird... Again, this identity resistance politic, which I think is really problematic yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's some. Anti I think it's. It's. <laughs> I think they're on both sides or all sides. They're anti-sex. Actually, I think. By the way, I have an argument that Trump is queer. <laughs> I do. No, I, he is. He's, well, a, <laughs> he's also black, by the way. <laughs> I, honestly, no. Seriously, right. I have a whole argument for that, but we can do that another time. Um, no, I mean, he is in that he breaks all those rules, right? He breaks all, not all, but many of the cardinal rules of. Um, heteronormativity, uh -huh. being a heteronormative man, um, actually of respectable masculinity. He breaks all those rules uh -huh. of being a respectable upper class huh. person in America, right? And he's black in that way too, right? So he's all about gold plated, you know, gold plated everything. Who does that? Rappers. <laughs> Rappers do that. And is that good or bad? It's horrible. It, it shows that they don't know about money. They're not disciplined. They're not responsible, right? They're self-aggrandizing. All these bourgeois virtues, mm -hmm. right? They're violating. They're driving a truck through it. Trump does the same thing. He so, and his wife are sex workers also. So, well, yeah, yeah essentially, no, no. yeah. So, I mean... No, I'm, I mean, they were both... Yeah, his wife is a model. It means he cares about sex and not about her virtue, not about her intelligence, not about her, you know, her moral standing. It's just that she's a model. And so that's bad too. Bourgeois culture said, you know, you got to treat people as non, it's your point, non-sexual objects. He's like, no, she's sexual. My, my daughter is hot. You know, it's mm -hmm. the worst thing you can say, but he's actually violating all those rules. He treats the world as sex place, you know, uh, sort of like you do. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, um, he doesn't do it. As and well. so like he is actually, he is like the drag Queens and he is like the rappers in that way. Did you want to ask me a direct I, question? Oh, yeah. I want to bring you back. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I want to track back. Totally. You uh, are. Yeah. How the fuck are we going to track back through that? Watch me. You got a machete? 
what do you why, oh oh cut, so through the, cut through the jungle yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no no um so uh yeah you're the devil man you're the devil in this public school i love that that's my favorite thing in the whole wide world that's my favorite thing is the five-year-old kindergartner who asks the question why am i here basically is really what you were asking you know um punk rock i didn't know about that you didn't talk about that last week so how did when did you get into punk rock how did I get into punk rock? It's a really good question that I've never had to answer before. This was 80s, 90s, 90s? 90s. I think my sister listened to good music. Late, Ooh, late 80s. Good music. My, late 80s. That was a modernist turn you just took there. Uh, good music is the worst thing you can say. Good music to me. Let's yeah, just say yeah, that. I so I, music yeah. that you liked. <laughs> <laughs> Are we about to have a Joe Rogan crazy discussion yes. where we talk about the no. word good for no, an hour? Not. No, okay. Not. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I think that I think that was it. I think she listened to like sort of cool, weird music, and I just like what? latched onto it. Uh, God, what did she listen to? I mean, these these are sort of starter bands, so they're not what I uh -huh. ended up listening to. Um, she listened to Ween, which was completely bonkers, right? At the, the first Ween album that had come out at the time, which was just bizarre. She listened to um, she listened to The Descendants. Mm -hmm. um, she listened to uh, what else did she listen to? I mean, the grunge bands before grunge hit. She would listen to like Screaming Trees and these sorts of bands. So. It was like I was encountering all that stuff. And then, of course, you know, and she listened to this band called Mary's Danish, which was this California band. Oh, yeah. So there's all these like, yeah, alternative bands and sort of punk bands that were precursors to be the time that alternative and punk hit. So I was listening to that stuff. And then, of course, Nirvana came out and, you know, that led down its own sort of weird rabbit hole. But then I, I just would like get these music catalogs and start going to shows and seeing local punk bands and, you know, paying attention to what kind of music they liked, who they were covering, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, getting record label catalogs It was before the internet. So you had to do all this, these sort of weird moves. Mm -hmm. Um, but interestingly, I knew way more about music then than I do now. <laughs> right. But what about that particular mu music was attractive to you? Oh, Hmm. You know, before I sort of woke up to the sentiment that there was a fuck you, I won't do what you tell me aspect of that music, right? That'd be a hard question for me to answer. I'm not sure what I liked about it before I understood that that's what it was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe I had an intuition or maybe I just liked it because my sister thought it was cool. You know, my sister was hanging out with skaters that I wanted to fuck me, you know, or something like oh, that. Oh, so that's interesting. Yeah. So here's why, I, <laughs> here's why I didn't like it, that music. Uh. It wasn't sexy. <laughs> so if you think about That's it, funny. right? So to me, there are there have been in the, in in my lifetime since the 1960s, 1970s, there have been two major forms of, you know, alternative, antagonistic, subversive, I suppose, countercultural music, right? Punk rock and hip hop. Mm. Okay, of course, yes, I know both have gone commercial in various ways, and both have not always been antagonistic and countercultural. But you know that's certainly where they started, and I think that still they are still fundamentally countercultural. Here's the difference to me, and I've always I was always the white kid who loved the black music, and I was around punk rockers because it was huge in Berkeley in the '80s when I was a teenager. Um, so I knew it like the hardcore scene and all that. Uh, I just didn't like it because it was like about anger, which is cool. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, but that was it. Like it ended with anger. <laughs> it was just uh -huh. sort of like bald headed guy, uh, with a leather jacket screaming on a stage mm -hmm. about the cops or his parents or you name it. Fine. Great. I get it. It's your thing about resistance. You right. know, to me, it's sort of just resistance. And often it wasn't even political, which is also fine, but it just, it was sort of this, hard, narrow, often mean, often usually very masculine in that way, um, art form. And it's just, I, I just have never liked that, but it's not sensual, mm. right? In fact, it's deliberately anti-sensual. It was a reaction to disco and a reaction to sort of hippie flower music, both of which are quite sensual. One is very sexual and one is very much about like lying in fields with you know, the maiden and the flowers. Um, right. I mean, so it was a very, and the, the piercings, the safety pins, the, the deliberate infliction of pain. Well, I don't want to get SJW on you, but I think that was because you're a, a dude that likes women when you're younger. That's because fine. When, yeah. when you are a guy watching the fucking intense, sweaty, screaming punk rock singer, 
saying fuck you to the world mm-hmm. and you're attracted to men and you haven't told anybody you're attracted to men, Ooh. nothing could be more sexual. Oh, awesome. It was overwhelmingly Thank sexual yeah. because it was like, I missed that. I didn't get that. The outsiders are screaming and sweating and they're on stage in camaraderie with each other and all sort of performing together hmm. to me. So fucking hot. Hmm. So hot. And then, and then, and then the, the men just sort of pushing up against each other in the audience. If it was a big show or, you know, um, or, or, or getting physical with each other and, and very, there was a lot of a uh, touchy touchy camaraderie among the guys too, that yeah. it would just, it was so erotic yeah. for me. But, um, I get, of course I get the version you're saying too. Why it wouldn't be, yeah. it would be anti-sensual. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I also agree with you totally. Like when I, when I said it's not central, I immediately was thinking, but it's of course erotic uh-huh. in the, you know, in many ways, but I can certainly immediately see what you're talking about it being erotic. Um, I mean, to me, everything's erotic, right? Uh-huh. So I mean, sex is <laughs> sure. everywhere. You and I agree yeah. on that too. Um, it's just that that particular kind of eroticism doesn't appeal to me. That's all. But it was, it was, um, yeah, that's all it's, I, I happened to choose for whatever reason, you know, a particular form of sensuality and eroticism, right. you know, as what I liked. And it was sort of, and it was the antithesis, the deliberate antithesis to that stuff. I mean, I was into soul and disco and dance music. Like mm. it's also, it was like deliberately anti-dance. <laughs> and to me, dance is really, really important. Dancing, mm. um, social dancing. And to me, that's where liberation is. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Cause I once said sort of riffing off of Emma Goldman, if it's not, if, if I can't, stand by the bar and not dance to it it's not my revolution exactly. <laughs> because yeah. i hate dancing yeah yeah emma's emma's like the one and i know that's not that's a misquote of her too she didn't actually say that no but, but she was... yeah i mean she was more problematic <laughs> but she's one of the few sort of people on the left that i can i can be sympathetic to but um she's awesome yeah well she's got some problems but <laughs> look at what she said about sex work by the way she was not good on sex work <laughs> no but she did hate marriage so that was fine. yeah no she was like good on she, she, she started to even it out in some way but she was she sucked on sex work <laughs> She was she was anti sex work, <laughs> and you're 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 doing sex work because you're um you know forced to by circumstance was her argument, <laughs> you know. I'm forced to by my desires. <laughs> yeah, no, she wouldn't say that. <laughs> That's exactly what she did not say. So, um, you yeah, know, I can totally get that. Yeah, if you're attracted to masculine men. Hey, that's the place to be. So then the, the question arises immediately in my mind, like, hmm, all those guys, because it was mostly guys, not entirely, but all those guys who are really into that scene. Is that what was going on with them? <laughs> I think it was that. I think it was also just a form of spirituality for a lot of people in the sense of, you know, and that, that is, I would say it was transcendent beyond resistance, but people just didn't know it. So in the sense of fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. The question remains, well, what will you do? And the answer was, I'll make music. And to me, that is a a creation after the refusal. And to me, that is spiritual. And so I think a lot of people went for those reasons. And that's why also you find spiritual themes running through some punk rock music. But also, the punk rock that I was listening to that I eventually got deeper and deeper into was really post-punk music. So I lived, you know, grew up in Pennsylvania. And so it was really this sort of Discord record scene, and that's who I was inviting to play shows. So um, this wasn't Discord, but close enough, this band called Chisel, which Ted Leo, if you know Ted Leo, was in Chisel, and I had them play like a whole, and, and just had himself play a bunch of times. His brother was in this band called The Van Pelt. Um, these weirdo, this band called The Dismemberment Plan, which now uh, people, a lot of people know them, but before they had really almost anything out they came in they played four shows um these bands that were really bizarre in a lot of ways that were doing strange things that were doing things that weren't just uh kind of i mean maybe they didn't know how to play their instruments but that that weren't just about not knowing how to play their instruments and expressing anger and a a fuck you it started evolving into this post-punk movement and those people um, this sort of Fugazi dismemberment plan, Shudder to Think, um, Brainiac, these bizarro bands that were doing weird things that would define not just the political sphere and culture, but also define what you would think music should be and what you think art should be. That's where it started getting really potent and powerful for me and remains in that space for me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Postmodernist here, this guy talking. Um, <laughs> his, his, I don't know if it's a contradiction, but I've always had destinations, you know, mm. even though I know they're social constructs, even though I know like I've basically been taught or trained or whatever to think in a particular way or to want a thing. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to get somewhere and get it. Mm-hmm. And I'm just saying my destination was like 
the the black disco club right and by the way i was gonna say like this is also so i was attracted as a kid to sort of black working class culture and gay male culture Mm. was like i came to that a little bit later but like by the time i was in college i was like oh yeah okay that's that's what it's about my politics is best represented by i don't know if you know this but like i'm one of the leading historians of black drag queens. I don't know if you know this, but yeah, like I have, I knew a little bit about, I have scholarly, big scholarly article written Um. about the history of black drag queens. And, um, and you know, I'm friends with the people who make RuPaul's drag race. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but no, but scholarly and just politically, like I was like, Oh yeah, that's exactly it. That's what I'm about. Not that it's correct or right or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just that I'm attracted to that. Uh, I don't like drag shows. I don't, particularly like that aesthetically but the 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 cultural and sexual politics generally of the drag scene Mm. over the last 60 or so years has been about the violation of bourgeois norms not just to violate them like Mm. punk rockers Mm -hmm. but to to aggrandize myself one's self i am beautiful in a way that you don't think is beautiful but i think is beautiful and my sisters think is beautiful right sisters of course Mm -hmm. the generic form um uh and and celebrating myself and my body is good to me even though you think it's a bad thing in all sorts of ways yeah right um and there's also if you look at the drag scene it's always been phenomenally integrated in every which way Mm -hmm. right so in terms of race we have like blacks and whites dancing together at big drag balls in Harlem in the 1940s and 1950s, the height of segregation, super integrated. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were drag kings as well, you know, doing the same thing. There were black drag kings. These were celebrities in the black community. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't care. Same with sex workers, right? And then I became attracted to sex workers after that for the same reasons, because they didn't give a shit. They're already breaking the biggest taboo. We we hang out with each other. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So you're all, you're breaking the biggest rules to start with so why not just go all the way which is generally what happens so you'll see much more crossing of the color line much the binary divisions are much softer or more fluid or dissolved entirely in in those groups right so gays uh blacks and uh i don't know what you would where you would put in trans Mm -hmm. until now of course now trans the trans movement is breaking my heart because now what they're doing is is reifying the hell out of it. They're saying, "Oh no, I was born a particular sex, particular gender." Right? They're doing what the trans. Well, some people, some people have it that way, and some people don't. I know. Right? Yeah. I, know. I think. I think. I think what would break my heart is if is is not that people are doing that. That's fine to me. But if the lesson that the people who aren't doing that were saying was lost, which is that we are not the bodies that you say we are, we decide. Exactly. That lesson is, and it's an anti-materialist lesson, That's which right. I think is really powerful. And, and, and I think, I don't think that lesson will be lost actually. I think that, I think that we'll retain that. And I think that it, it's a sign, you know, of things that are happening right now. I think it's really profound. I want, because you did it, I want to do this, which is say what my politics yeah, are. Please. But I also want, I would love people who are listening would do it too. Just like, what is it? Like, could you just say it? You know, mm-hmm. I could say on so, in so many different ways. I could say, well, my politics are the occult. You want to know what my politics are? They're the occult. Mm-hmm. If you don't know what that means or how the occult could be politics, um, think about it. Like, I'll, I'll, or we can have a conversation about it. My politics are, I, you know, have said like, if you want to know my politics, I like sucking dicks and reading books and I want to do whatever makes those two things more available to everybody and myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or, you know, I could say, you know, Oscar Wilde once said, I want to learn as much about life from pleasure as other people do from suffering. And to me, that's also my politics. It's I'm pleasure is, you know, so frowned upon by so many people. It could be Christian fundamentalists or it could be socialists. Marxists hate pleasure. They're so suspicious of it. And I, I think that that's sick and stupid, um, about, about Marxist movements, um, because they conflate it with commodity fetish and whatever, whatever. I'm not going to get too into my irritation. Well, no, I'll tell you why. You want to know why? Go ahead. No, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) But that, but that to me, pleasure, um, you know, for me, um, and we talked about this a little bit last time. <laughs> Sorry, we keep referring to that, guys. But anyway, um, instead of Marx, choose Fourier. And Fourier is this, 
utopian thinker who said that we could really create a world that was based on pleasure, um, but what happens if it's pleasure for everybody, not just pleasure for some, and all the sort of crazy things, and he really went far afield. He said planets were bisexual and were having sex with each other and the oceans were made out of lemonade and people could have, you know, you probably have a pet giraffe or whatever and there was a sexual minimum so everybody gets to have a certain amount of sex and beautiful people had to have sex with ugly people and there was no monogamy and, you know, I mean, just this, this brilliant person and uh, to me, go there, you know, like Mar Marxism is not enough for me to uh, use the title of a book by a poet, Laura Riding, anarchism is not enough. And um, it's, it's none of it's enough for me. I want, I want more out of my imagination. And whenever I hit the limit, um, that's not, I, I got, I got to go past it. <laughs> you want pleasure. You want more pleasure and you want other people to have more pleasure. Yeah as they define it yes awesome but i don't but i will say that um i want us to uh, so, something i would say is almost an imperative although i don't i don't think anybody really i don't really no one has an imperative to do anything i fucking say um but it would be great if we could imagine more mm -hmm. um and and if we would stop doing stupid bullshit like well i'm gonna vote for hillary clinton because donald trump's like oh well no not hillary clinton but bernie sanders oh well not bernie sanders but uh let's all actually just be marxist okay well not marxist let's but it's like all these limited such limited moves and it's like man you realize you can think literally think anything why the fuck are you thinking you this shit there you go so you know what you're sounding like to me it's the division between the new left the political new left of the 1960s and the so-called counterculture of the 1960s they hated each other mm -hmm. so my parents were of the political new left the ones who were all about you know institutions government economics blah 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 right the stuff that you were just talking about often marxist not necessarily but they were in, into that stuff the hard stuff the real stuff right the real politics and they looked down on the hippies across the bay in San Francisco, who were just frolicking in the grass and gays, they tolerated, but you know they were not fans of the clubs and the and the bathhouses because why? Because that's frivolous. It's not about real stuff. It's not about really managing society. It's not about taking responsibility. There's a puritanism at the heart of all left wing politics mm -hmm. because it's about managing society, which requires discipline, right? Right, and responsibility. So you're. It's. I have not heard this anybody except you. <laughs> ever maybe you know really articulating and standing with those hippies the counterculture the gay liberationists not the guys who wrote the manifestos although i love them because they sure. said the right things i'm talking about the guys who are fucking in the backs of trucks in chelsea fuck yeah in man. 1975 totally right you know about that have you you've seen them yeah amazing documentary yeah. gay sex and yeah gay, gay sex, sex in, in the, the 70s. 70s yeah greatest film ever made That's great yeah so um that's who I'm talking about, right? It's doing exactly what you're not supposed to do. Not just to not just not just to be oppositional, but because you want it. You actually want to do it. Because you want to suck dick. Yes. Right? That's 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 the principle. It's you know, how dare you not aspire to have a world that's just an orgy? How dare you? <laughs> because because you fucking want it. Why are you stopping? This is why I find things so reprehensible when people it, it's not just that I believe in social justice so people say trans doesn't exist. I get fucking ir irritated and I hate that because people are n refusing to imagine more than their stupid ideas. Right. And so when, it's, when we say it's sort of something socially constructed and people go against that or they get mad or irritated again about that, I'm like, what the fuck happened to your imagination? That's, right. That's exactly right. Yeah, so the closet was a modern invention. Yes. It doesn't exist without modernism because it says that homosexuality is unnatural, right? Um, yeah, and so postmodernism, you said it so beautifully right then. It's like, I guess above all else, it's just saying you can think differently. You can want differently. Yes. And, and how about this quote from Gilles Deleuze, who I mentioned before, who basically said um, that hatred is the destruction of, or the attempt to destroy difference. So if you want to know <laughs> where you're at with how well you regard other people, um, look into your ability to um, imagine different things. 
if you can start imagining multiples, crazy variations, all that kind of stuff, if you can get into a total sense of absolute difference everywhere you look, then you really do care about freedom. Yeah. If it's a homogenizing thing, whether that comes in the form of free speech, a cry of free speech, or in, the, uh, in, in a certain kind of free speech, or if it comes in the form of speech policing, or it comes in the form of certain identities being fixed, or forms, physical forms being fixed, then like, you're not doing enough. Then you hate something, and you definitely hate something about yourself. <laughs> but you're the devil. I, I am. Here's, what I, here's my last question for you. Are you. So I said that I have <laughs> mixed feelings about being the devil. My mother said, you're always looking for opposites. <laughs> you're always looking for the opposite of whatever it is. You know? And she's right, and I am, but then I feel bad about it. I feel like a bad guy. I basically walk around, honestly, feeling like I did something bad and I'm about to be found out for it. And I think it is that. Like it's, it's true, I am always doing something bad because I am always looking for opposites. I'm always asking the questions you're not supposed to ask, right? And that's what this podcast is about. Are you, do you have any of that ambivalence? Are you just, I mean, so in my, in my, in my straight boy imagination, I think that's why gays have been so attractive. Gay men in particular have been so attractive to me is because I always imagined them to be, you know, just, and I think this is sort of true in some sense, but you know, just doing what they want to do and without shame, at least since the closet was torn down in 1969, right? Since then, since gay liberation, Generally speaking, that's why I've been so attracted to them and found them so heroic is that they act feminine without shame when I want to act feminine in some ways and feel terrible about it. They talk about sex when you're not really supposed to talk about sex. Right. Um, but anyway, do you, I'm looking for opposites. You do too. Do you ever feel bad in any way? I did. And I, I really... I mean, I do sometimes, obviously, in personal relationships and stuff like that, where I fuck up and oh I'm an God. asshole How or do whatever. We do relationships but, as, but, <laughs> as us? I don't well, even get it. <laughs> well, but but I don't feel bad about my being at all anymore. And that moment with the devil was followed up maybe a, a couple of years later when I found a book, and this will be, I guess, the last story I tell. This book I found in my library. Bizarre that it was there in my middle school library. Um, curses, hexes, and spells. I stole it because that's what you're supposed to do <laughs> when you see a book like that. And I went home and tried to summon the devil and uh, created a voodoo doll, tried to turn myself into a cat. I did all the spells in this book. I felt bad about that shit until last year. Wow. I carried that. And I was not raised religiously. So I didn't have Christian guilt. I felt badly about that stuff until last year and my friend Gordon White who's an occultist he said to me um he said oh you just feel bad because you're racist and I was like what and he's like don't you get it in every other culture <laughs> every indigenous culture if you heard something growl at you and then you tried to summon it back up and have some sort of communication with it like people would look at you very differently and you would think something very different about yourself because you would be the person that was working with those forces. It's just in this one that even when you're not raised religiously, you still imbibe that shit that mm -hmm. you think that something's bound. So after that, I started to just last year, just talk to the devil, right? Not Satan, the devil. These are two different things in the occult, by the way. But I just started to talk to the devil and just like think, who are you? What are you doing? You, were you here to hurt me or was there something about you that was really important to me? And I used to have this image of God looking down on me and seeing some fuck up distorted thing that did like created a mark on my soul when I was like eight years old by doing these things or nine years old by doing these like spells and hearing the devil and all that kind of stuff. And now I have a vision of being looked upon as someone who is mediating the dark forces um, that are dark because people don't see or understand in them and that these forces are also part of the thing that's looking down upon me. So it's all come together and that's me now. Wow. Uh, something to aspire to, I think for me, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say, uh, except thank you.
Yeah, man, this is great. I loved having this conversation with you. Me too. Twice. It's really, <laughs> yeah, no, it really is just, there's something about you. I just, it's just pure pleasure. Like often, uh, there's going to be some competitiveness when I do this, you know, just sort of, that's, that's the way I'm built. You know, I try not to be, I try to work against that. I don't know. I mean, I guess there's a little bit of that here, but like, not really. It just, it feels feel like we're just all. skating. Yeah. It's that smooth. Like, it's just easy. I don't. You know? Yeah, I hope I hope people listening to you <laughs> feel that way instead of. But you know, it's like I think I think uh, I think this is what happens when two people have a conversation and they're interested in each other. And uh, I wish more people would do that. Yeah, good idea, right? Yeah. All right, man. Thank you. Yep. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. Please don't forget to check out unregisteredlisteners.com to support the show. And if you're interested in the special weekend event in Salem, Massachusetts, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses slash weekend. Thanks for listening.